The US is going through something of a reckoning right now about its racial past, the inequalities, the inequities in terms of those racial tensions in the United States. That conversation is happening. Does China need to start thinking about some of its past? When will China, when is it appropriate for China to address some of the darker parts of its history, including 1989, June, June the 4th? Now, first of all, uh, let's condemn the racism and racial prejudice and persecution which are prevalent in the United States. The recent uh, demonstrations, etc., uh, reveal that these problems are deeply rooted. And the fact that many cities in the world are demonstrating uh, in protest of such police brutality against uh, uh, Afro-American uh, is a vindication that there are uh, uh, necessities uh, to condemn and to fight against such persecutions. Number two is that if China has learned anything from 1989, that is, China does not need a revolution. China needs a peace and stability. And whatever differences there are, China needs to be united in development, in seeking peace. And this is the biggest lesson from 1989. And I think this lesson is not only relevant to mainland China, it's relevant to Hong Kong, it's relevant to the whole world, maintaining peace and stability and try to avoid the violence or revolution is the key precondition of any economic development and prosperity. Yeah, the concern, of course, amongst people in Hong Kong, but also some people here in China, is that that preference, that focus on stability. Economic stability comes at a significant cost. And of course, the pan-democrats and the opposition forces in Hong Kong are very concerned about the implications of this security law. What can you say that would go any way to convincing them that this isn't going to pose a significant threat to them as individuals? Well, first of all, ever since July the 1st, 1997, the basic law has been the cardinal law for Hong Kong. And in the basic law, there is a particular provision stipulating that the Hong Kong legislature or the Hong Kong SR government need to enact a national security law. For very obvious reasons, Hong Kong has not been able to do that. And therefore, as a result, no one in the world should pretend to be surprised that China, the sovereign country over Hong Kong, has the sovereign unconditional right to amend the basic law, which is the cardinal law for Hong Kong, by inserting the national security law into the basic law. And the basic law is not against anything else or anyone else. It is very specifically targeting against those forces or individuals which are bent upon interfering in China's national security interest in Hong Kong. I would emphasize that no country in the world will allow any part of its sovereign territory to be misused or abused to constitute a threat to the national security interests of a country, be it the United States, Britain, or any European countries, African countries, or Asian countries, you name it. This is a must. China should not be an exception. Whether it is one country, two system, or one country, three system, should not constitute an excuse for any political force to abuse Hong Kong to threaten China's national security interests. Uh, Victor, this is David in, in Hong Kong. Thank you for coming on the program. I mean, it, it doesn't mean because you can, you shouldn't. And, you know, one of the points of contention, and we can talk about the national security law aside, one of the points of contention is how it was introduced. You know, you mentioned it, it was inserted, uh, or it is, it will be inserted as well. Don't you think one country, two systems is, is also a recognition of the processes here in Hong Kong that would merit you having one of these, that it has to go through the legislative process in Hong Kong? What would you say to those people? No, I would say... Uh, even before July the 1st, 1997, Hong Kong was not supposed to be a territory which would constitute an intervention or threat to the Chinese national security interest. And therefore, 
after July the first, mm. nineteen ninety seven, Hong Kong should not, by any means or any imagination possible, become a place to constitute a threat to China's national security interest. We have seen very clearly over the past several years there are political forces in and outside of Hong Kong which are bent upon creating all the troubles. And if you use the standards that we now witness in the United States, the U.S. government should not condemn the violence and the anarchy in Hong Kong over the past one year and over the past several years. However, look at the double standards. They claim that the police forces in Hong Kong are taking away human rights or democratic rights of the Hong Kong people. Look at how civilized the police force in Hong Kong is. It is one of the best performing police forces in the world. How can anyone with decency of mind compare Hong Kong police with, for example, their counterparts in the United States? Look at what the American police is doing in front of the White House. Look at the way they are doing against the Australian press people and many press people from other countries. So let's use the same standards. Let's call a spade a spade. Hong Kong is the best place to do business under one country, two system, and it needs to be the same for the rest of the 50 years. And I would say people in Hong Kong sooner or later will realize that the national security law is not against one country, two system. Rather, it is designed to make mm. sure that one country, two system will not be trampled upon and will continue to flourish up to 2047. Yeah, uh, Victor, I, I, I want to bring back again the, the first question of Tom here. And, it, I mean, this applies not just to Hong Kong. You mentioned a few very good examples, of course, of, of what's happening outside. You know, th there's a lot, I mean, there are a lot of examples in history where the, the letter of the law is not a guarantee that the sanctity of the spirit of the law is not violated. Back to Tom's earlier question, do you think Beijing needs to go the extra mile given given its history, given the superpower that China wants to become, to do something extra to assure people that this will not in infringe on democratic rights in Hong Kong? I would say democratic rights, human rights, political rights in Hong Kong should be absolutely protected. And I've always been emphasizing that people in Hong Kong, which is a democracy, have full right to demonstrate and protest if they do that peacefully, if they mm. do that against the law, if they uh, deteriorate into anarchy and attack on innocent human beings and uh, vandalizing properties, for example, then they need to be dealt with by the Hong Kong law. This is absolutely <clears throat> necessary. And there is no interest for Hong Kong or for mainland China to undermine the political system in Hong Kong because this is the basis for the flourishing business and financial activities in Hong Kong. And mainland China has all the vested interest, as Deng Xiaoping declared before 1997, to do whatever that is necessary to protect all the political rights of the people in Hong Kong, to make yep. sure that Hong Kong continues to flourish as the best place to do business. I don't think this national mm. security Victor. law will do anything... Victor. Victor, do that. Victor let, me t let me just interrupt. Look, Hong Kong is, you said Hong Kong is a democracy. It is not a democracy. So that, let's just clear that one up. OK, it hasn't been a democracy. It wasn't a democracy under the British. It's not a democracy now. Uh, in terms of calling a spade a spade, let's call a spade a spade. Why do booksellers need to be smuggled out of Hong Kong uh, and taken over to mainland China? Uh, if they are abiding by the rule of law. If they're abiding by the rule of law here in mainland China, why do two Canadians need to be held in detention for more than 500 days, apparently as an act of ret retaliation uh, against the Canadians for the case of Huawei? Uh, why are more than a million Muslims held in camps in Xinjiang? These people, again, many of them, you would argue, are abiding by the rule of law. And this mm. is the concern, is that the rule of law is how Beijing interprets it, Victor. We know this, you know this. Well, first of all, do you call the United States a better democracy than the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom still has a monarchy? No, I don't think so. I think democracy is a democracy, and democracy has varying degrees of democracy. 
And if you compare what the people in Hong Kong have in terms of their political rights, you probably, in the objectivity of your mind and in the decency of your judgment, you probably will rate Hong Kong as one of the best democracies in the whole world. And, of course, when there are, you know, particular judiciary cases, uh, we need to get to the bottom of it. We need to make sure that rule of law is very much asserted and people's rights are protected. And I would say in Hong Kong, as we have seen over the past several years, what dominated the front pages are those violent acts, are those illegal activities, are those arsons, etc., which are being aided and abetted by foreign forces. And these are exactly... Victor, very quickly, very quickly... national security law is absolutely necessary.